don't compare yourself with other people. Like just compare yourself with yourself, right? And so if you are doing these Kaggle competitions and you're learning and you're getting better and like you look at your past self and you're like, I know more now than I did in the past, that's a success. And like focus on that. It's totally fine if other people are better than you. You're probably better than other people, right? But the most important thing and the thing you should really focus on is that you are becoming a better person in some way. Welcome back to the Exploding Podcast. My name is Asia and thanks to each and every single one of you who come back every time to learn, to execute and to expert for a better purpose. And it's very rare that I get a chance to sit with the person who inspired me a lot to learn what I'm curious about and someone who is so fascinated about taking initiatives. So has anyone told you that you should become a data scientist or a machine learning engineer or a data analyst? Or have you heard it has a great career? Or you might have heard like the data scientist is a top required job in 21st century, right? But how do you find the right path to becoming one, right? So don't worry. At the end of this episode, you're going to get a huge relief as we're going to uncover the person's life journey on shifting various careers and starting fresh every time and building himself into it. So today's guest is one of my best teachers on deep learning, a senior AI engineer. As you already know, he is Matt Lenard. Before we move ahead, a huge shout out to Sundog Education for sponsoring this episode. Join over half a million learners across the world. You can learn machine learning, AI, and big data just for $25 a month. All you need is some prior programming or scripting experience with a high school level math. With a lot of hands-on activities and exercises, you can practice whatever you have learned. Visit sundog-education.com and sign up for a free trial course to start your journey towards a lucrative and rewarding career in the hardest technology. That's sundog-education.com. Now, on to the ad-free show. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. How are you doing? Early in the morning there? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. It is, what, 8 a.m.-ish? Uh, yeah, but I have my tea, so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah. So, so I'm going to give you a quick intro. So that is how we start. So are you ready for that? Yeah. <laughs> ready. <laughs> So Matt is a teacher, instructional designer, product lead, content developer, and postdoctoral researcher. Matt received his PhD in physics from UC Berkeley, but actually did experimental neuroscience research. After his grad school, Matt joined Udacity as a content developer teaching all about data science. In January 2017, Matt built Udacity's deep learning nano degree as the lead instructor. Later year, he became the product lead of all AI programs and launched the School of AI in early 2018. Moving off from Udacity, after a brief stint creating content for Kaggle, he started as a senior AI engineer at a startup by about a year ago. Now, Matt is keenly focused on applied computer vision and research. Outside his professional life, he spent a lot of time working on open source Python libraries. Previously, Matt contributed to PySwift and created Sabi, an experimental functional deep learning library built on JAX. On top of all of that, Matt believes education is the best way to improve individual lives and society. And I can't wait anymore to start exploring with Matt Lennart. Thank you so much for being here, Matt. I'm super excited to have you on the show. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. So, by the way, like, uh, I love your Twitter handle and, and I love what you're doing now, taking tea, like Matt drinks tea. So how often you you take tea in, a, in each day, in every single day? Uh, every morning. Yeah. So typically my, my process is, you know, I get some loose leaf, steep it. That's my first one. Steep it mm. again, right? Mm. Second tea. Um, and so that's usually my morning. And then... Uh, yeah, I usually do the same process with a different tea in the <laughs> afternoon. So I kind of like try to like maintain a nice tea level inside of me like all day long. So, I mean, like uh, any correlation or causation between drinking tea and training models or any sort of thing that happens <laughs> with you? <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah. So one thing, like I feel tea is very calming, right? So, I mean, as far as like caffeine, it helps you wake up, but tea doesn't have as much caffeine as coffee. Like, you know, you drink mm. coffee and you get this caffeine spike and you, I don't know, yeah, but like yeah, tea yeah. is just very mellow and it's also very calming and it kind of, I feel like it helps me relax and focus, you know? Mm, yeah. yeah. So if I just ask you, like, uh, what do you think, you know, which like you among like TensorFlow, PyTorch or cafe, I doubt you would choose cafe cause <laughs> it's a Latin word is coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so is that true? Like you really, you really enjoy working with cafe over PyTorch and TensorFlow? Is that true? Ooh, PyTorch. <laughs> PyTorch is the thing. Yeah. 
All right, okay. So, but I'll ask you about later on moving off for why by torch and why not TensorFlow and Cafe. Get ready yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that. Definitely. So, uh, so how the field has evolved ever since you, it's been years, like it's been so long that you've been to AI and working on the various things into, you know, you've been into the foundations of Udacity's and nano degrees and deep learning and all of that, right? So, uh, how the field was evolved since you are into AI? So how did AI become into, came into your life? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, when I was in grad school, um, I started or I took a it was kind of introduction to computational neuroscience. So it was, you know, neural networks before mm. deep learning was a thing. And so, um, you know, backpropagation was, I guess, discovered in the, the 80s and people were, were using it for various things. And, you know, there's um, these different kinds of networks like Boltzmann machines and hot field networks. Um, and these sort of things that are, are neural networks, but not mm. what we know now is like, you know, deep learning, um, convolutional yeah. networks and things like that. And these yeah. were, you know, um, a lot of people were studying these things and it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, so I learned about this in like 2011 or so. Mm. So, um, yeah, so deep learning and, um, became a thing in like 2014, even though like Jan LeCun and some other people were doing kind of smaller applications of it. Um, but once, um, yeah, AlexNet was a thing. So kind of the, the transition happened because people got access to very large data sets, mm -hmm. um, and then access to GPUs. So, cause like all the technology otherwise was there, like backpropagation existed and, you know, they had, um, like Theano, which was a, a framework for doing like automatic gradients that you need for this stuff. So yeah. kind of like a lot of technology already existed, but being able to do the computations efficiently on GPUs was just a watershed moment. Um, and then having access to big data, because I think that's, that's the thing that we were missing is that just the amount, we didn't really know the amount of data that you needed to actually mm. train these models, right. To do yeah. these amazing things. Um, yeah. So I, it's kind of interesting to say I started studying neural networks and stuff before deep learning was a thing. Um, and then now it's like all deep learning, right? Because there <laughs> yeah. were all these like interesting other networks that people were working on. And now it's just all deep learning all the time. Um, yeah. But anyways, so that's like kind of the early part. <laughs> yeah. So when I was in uh, grad school, I were like during my research, I had to use some machine learning to um, kind of analyze some data and like do some other things. And so I learn more about general machine learning outside of like the neural network stuff, um, doing that. And then when we were at, or when I was at Udacity, um, so as you know, Sebastian Thrun is the, the founder of Udacity. Yeah. He yeah. worked at Google. And so he had a lot of connections at Google. Um, so when, uh, TensorFlow was open source, I think it was open source, like the late, late 2016. And that was the, um, the first thing Yeah, TensorFlow was like the first, framework that kind of normal people could use, you know, people who aren't researchers, uh, which is like another kind of watershed moment, like normal people, not researchers being able to create neural networks. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Code. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that happened. And then we created a deep learning course and um, it's just like a, a, it was a free deep learning course that we worked with Google to make. And then we're like, okay, so we've got this course, this, you know, this AI stuff is really blowing up. Um, let's, you know, think about like an, a bigger nano degree program. Um, then at that time, so, you know, um, Siraj. Yeah. So he was involved in the, the deep learning program. So he was working on his own um, YouTube channel. Yeah. And yeah, so he was going to do this like series of videos about deep learning and then somebody at Udacity was like, oh, hey, what if we, you know, built a program kind of in um, step, like in step with what he's doing so that we can add mm -hmm. his videos into our program and yeah. then he can promote our program on his YouTube channel. So, you know, kind of this nice uh, synergy between us. Exactly. And yeah, and so they're, they were like, hey, Matt, do you want to build this thing? And, you know, I had experience with this and I've been meaning to learn it because it was, you know, kind of the future and like super cool. And yeah. yeah, so I wanted to do that. Um, yeah, so I sort of like started it and 
it was a pretty crazy experience because we didn't actually have much content when it started. Mm. So I was basically making content on a week by week basis. Um, cool. Yeah. Which was fun, but really hard. But at the same time, it was really interesting and exciting because a lot of times I would just ask our students what they wanted to learn. I'd be like, yeah, hey, <laughs> what do you guys want to learn about next week? And then, and then I, they would tell me, and then I would make that. <laughs> That's the best way. That's the best way, right? We know, we get to know like what people are actually looking for yeah. and we deliver it and they really love it. And the next time they reach you back again. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, I yeah. need that again on another <laughs> subject. So let me help you on that. <laughs> yeah. This is great. So, yeah, that's good. I mean, uh, as you've been from early, early days, such like a uh, early bird, as you mentioned earlier. So, I mean, how was those days? Like in these days, like the data sets are quite available from various sources. Maybe you use a Kaggle or Google data sets or many other sources in the internet. You get a lot of repositories of data sets and you take that and you train it and you learn yeah. it, right? So how was those really, like how the data sets were being that, that time, like when you are being there? Yeah. So the data sets, um, like I was saying, like one of the, the kind of the watershed moments was, you know, we had access to GPUs, but also access to very large data sets. Um, mm. So ImageNet, right? Yeah. And that was what AlexNet was trained on. So that was one of the things is like ImageNet existed. Um, I believe uh, Feifei Li was like um, kind of the the PI or like the lead researcher that was putting together ImageNet. And I feel like people don't give her enough credit for this, but mm. I would like to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's um, great. Yeah. So because it was it was really just like this massive collection of images that gave the the you know Alex and these other neural networks like the power mm. that they needed to to generalize, right? Um yeah, and so at the when I first started learning, um there wasn't very like there wasn't many public data sets and then now there's like tons and tons of public data sets, which is which is nice. Um, especially if like you're learning stuff and yeah, yeah, it's good. So, I mean, uh, in the same way, like when, when we look into another view, like data sets is one of the, you know, troubles or another kind of a resource lacking those days. But you know, these days learning data science and machine learning, or, or I mean, we don't have such terms earlier. Like there is only usual, very common terms like data mining is the one which usually hurts a lot. You, you know, you people hear a lot and they use it a lot. Now there's a lot of terms getting evolved and different things and coming up different and different other and other coming up. So, I mean, the learning resources are also getting increased, right? For example, like the deep learning nano degrees yeah. and many other offline, and you know, mock courses are also coming up and moving forward. So how was those days? Masters is the only one that actually, you know, you go and you learn. Is that so? Like, how was those days? Yeah, it was pretty much um, you were doing a, like a PhD in computer science or, or like theoretical neuroscience or, you know, hmm. um, yeah, it was like only researchers and yeah. And then like I was saying before, like once TensorFlow was released, yeah. Cause before there was a framework called Theano that operated similarly to TensorFlow where you basically constructed a static graph and then you hmm. could, um, compute the gradients automatically like from yeah. the graph. Right. And then use those gradients to do back propagation and, and so on. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, it was built by researchers. I believe it was built by by Mila, so the um, machine learning research group. Um, I think that is um, what's his name, Bingio. I can't remember his mm. first name. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So when TensorFlow happened, then it just like became. Even though TensorFlow at the time is m much worse than. Like TensorFlow 1.0, in my opinion, is really hard to work with, but it's better than Theano. Um, so once TensorFlow happened, then everybody could just kind of start joining in, in, even if you weren't doing research, which is really cool and like really helped explode the the field. <laughs> Super. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe the turning point that would have happened. So, I mean, uh, as you've been from years and getting into, you know, all of that. So there are various paths to get into, you know, data science, like doing masters or starting a startup and getting a bunch of people around and working again together and you learn. But there are multiple, like countless ways that you could actually learn data science. Yeah. So. What is your your opinion on making picking the optimal is always a kind of a you know mindset that you people usually have, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> how about that strategy? Like, what approach is the optimal way in this time? This time, like twenty twenty. This time, yeah, twenty twenty. So, um, uh, yeah, in in COVID times, right? Online learning, <laughs> yeah. So, 
good job for all the online learning companies. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I think, um, yeah, there's an interesting issue because at least in the United States, the, the number of data science master's programs just exploded, right? I think they're, mm. you know, went from like five to hundreds, right? Within a couple of years, it was, it was crazy. Um, and at least in the U.S., I don't, I don't know how, how it is in other places, but there were so many people coming out of these programs that pretty much all the companies I talked to were like, we don't hire junior level data scientists. Like they're just too many mm. They're Like nobody has any experience actually doing this. Cause you know, there was just like, they're pumping out probably like tens of thousands of people, um, from these data science master's programs and they all wanted these data science jobs. Um, but so, you know, noting that, um, my my advice to people is to actually n- don't shoot for the data scientist job right away. Like try to get a data analyst role. Mm-hmm. So data analyst, very similar to data scientists. Um, yeah. There, a lot of data scientists, all they really do is just write SQL and you know build yeah. reports, which is what data analysts do, right? So um, my my advice is like if you're trying to get into like data science field, um, it's most likely better to start as a data analyst and kind of target your education that way. And then once you're in a company as a data analyst, then you can start um, building your experience there and like learning more to get you into those data scientist roles. Awesome. Um, yeah. But as far as education, um, doing stuff like online education, I'm a big fan of, I think you can, if you have the will and determination and motivation, you can learn anything technical you want online yeah. um, with, for free, basically, um, or for very little money. And the way I typically do it when I'm learning new stuff, like I learned React, I don't know, a year ago or something, mm-hmm. is I try to find a course and I do the first like month or so of it. And then after that, I just work on a, a personal project, right? Mm-hmm. And then so you, it's really helpful to have um, some educational material and a, and a teacher for like the first month or so just to kind of like teach you all the terms you need to know because because eventually you're gonna have to start googling things and so you have to know what you need to google right um so you just really need somebody to help you get started but then after that you you just need to like practice by building project after project after project just like keep building stuff um and yeah so and in my opinion like that's i mean that's how i do it I don't know if it's going to work for everybody, but I think it's a really good way to do it. So you just find something online, um, even something like at Udemy. Udemy, is, they have some really good courses for um, pretty little money, which is nice. Mm. And yeah, so just like do the first part of it, maybe even the first half. You don't have to do the whole thing, but just enough to get you going. And then you can um, just like work on it on your own, on your own personal projects. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, when you mentioned like, this is the best way, like, you know, but yeah. uh, in your view, so uh, what's the best portfolio to grab an opportunity in data science as you're into deep learning and computer vision? So let's be specific on it. Like when you mentioned like doing projects and, you know, learning by doing, right? So for students who are undergraduates or, gra- uh, you know, or postgraduates, any other. So what would be your suggestion, a set of portfolio that they would look alike into so that they build confidence. They just they just don't build resumes, yeah. but they just build confidence and the knowledge they could apply and they could get that. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so what what one thing I did, which and I think uh, this is something that I tried to promote at Udacity and like to our students is like build a blog. So hmm. what I mean by this is um, find some data that you're interested in analyze it, you know, like throw it, like get a Jupyter notebook, start writing stuff in it, um, analyze it, make a bunch of plots, like find conclusions out of it, you know, um, and just like write a blog post about, about everything you find and like how you did it. So, um, the reason this is really good is because like the way you're doing this is you're building portfolio, right? And so yeah. every, every blog post is like another project. So like every project you do, write a blog post about it. Um, and trying to explain things to other people in a way that they will understand is one of the best ways to learn anything. Like you, you really have to think about what you understand, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to try to like go over and over and over in your mind about like this, this topic that you're talking about and it helps you understand it better, um, to be able to explain it to other people. So 
um, yeah, writing a blog is, in my opinion, probably the best way to build a portfolio as a data analyst or data scientist. Hmm. So, I mean, for people out there who are actually, you know, work with uh, Jupyter Notebooks and they build the notebooks, but the best way is actually putting out to online is by fast pages, I guess. So by, it's by fast.ai, they release it to fast pages, but you can literally turn your Jupyter Notebook into a, actually a data science blog, right? That's amazing. Like, so people yeah. could actually check that out. That's a, a really good resource, which actually along with your context, right? You say you write the Jupyter Notebooks and build it up and you convert it into your blog. So definitely that's where like a fast pages could actually help as well. That should help. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also like, uh, when we say, um, mm, Usually when we try applying for data science roles, maybe data analyst or whatsoever, like the data science jobs. So when we try applying, so most of the times we feel that maybe I'm not ready for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you actually know whether you're ready for applying for a job or not? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. It, what I've heard is like, if you meet like 70% of the requirements that are listed, then you don't hmm. go for it. Uh, <laughs> so I would say in general um, for like a data analyst role, because you, you, the thing is like you do need experience generally, but the thing is like experience doesn't have to come from an actual job or it doesn't have to come from school, right? If you're just mm, yeah. building projects, writing blog posts, you know, that is experience. So I would say in general, if you're starting from scratch, like you haven't been in a data role at all, it'll probably um, honestly take like a year of, of experience, like building projects um, before you're really ready to apply for, um, yeah, like data analyst roles and like data scientist roles. It's probably like three years. Uh, mm. Yeah. Cool. And and also like uh, as you're already into into the industry for years and you're a senior AI engineer now, you know, you've been that process, you've been an intern as well. <laughs> you've been a junior a person in the company who works on data, plays with data and makes some mistakes and you actually learn from it and you become a senior now, right? You grow up, you thrive along with various situations. Yeah. <laughs> so now you're in a situation where you can actually, you know, make others pull them off. So get them into the company. Right. So what do you expect as if there is someone uh, in the undergraduate or graduate wherever? So if they if they if they are willing to get into your team. So what would be your expectations? Yeah. So I would say for me, it's yeah, it's not. Do you look for masters, PhDs or anything? No. Nah. I mean, I think <laughs> in general, I don't really care all that much about education. Um, like, yeah, mm. when I was hiring people at Udacity, I, I like glanced at the education part but i didn't ever really I'm like yeah if, you know if you went to stanford eh, that's fine if you went to like some you know university of iowa that's great too whatever it's mm. fine <laughs> um <laughs> yeah but it's more about just like the projects that people have built right um, cool yeah and then yeah because that's that's what excites me and then you can like because when people are are, are building projects especially like outside of work um, then it shows you that they're really interested in learning, right? So that's the biggest thing for me personally. If if somebody is interested and excited about learning, then mm. I know that they're going to be very good in their roles because they're going to want to learn everything they can about their roles, right? So yeah, I think the the worst thing is um, just people who just kind of come to work and just do what they're told and don't really think about anything, right? And don't want mm. to learn anything new. Um, yeah, so that's that's the really what I see is when I'm hiring people or want people on my team, I'm looking for potential, and that potential typically comes from people who are, are self learners, right, and who are motivated mm. to to do their own things and yeah, and just learn new things and try new things. Totally, and also, I mean, apart from this technicalities, maybe projects or any other things, do you look for some some sort of other skills apart from technology? Maybe it's like discipline. <laughs> you look for discipline. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So communication skills are, are one of the biggest thing. So how, um, because yeah, you're working on, on your projects, but there's typically like a project manager who's trying to keep track of everything. And it's like really, really, really important that in your work, you're communicating with your project manager, you're communicating with other people on the team. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know, just, and just generally like being nice. So the thing is when you're, you're working on a team, if there's even one person who isn't nice, who's a toxic person, it just makes everybody on the team 
unhappy. It makes it like really difficult um, for everybody. Mm-hmm. If there's this one person who is not a, a nice person. Right. So um, <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing. Yeah. So outside of, you know, technical things, it's like having good communication skills and mm. um, yeah. And just like generally being a nice, pleasant person. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, maybe that's when they be like a nice person. Maybe that also includes helping others yeah. and letting, letting, solving others' code and you know, writing answers in Stack Overflow. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> everything would be working. <laughs> so I mean, uh, and the same way, like when you mentioned about this project specifically. So this blog post that you convert a project to your blog post and you have a fully fledged, you know, a trust that you build on a recruiter or a person, a data scientist, or even yourself. So if I ask you, like. What are those actual projects that you really insist every person to do before they go for a job? Yeah. Um, ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. So one thing, um, yeah, one thing I did was I, yeah, one project I did is I explored different um, regularizations for linear models. And so, you know, you can um, just like get some data trying to make like predictions or, or, you know, you're doing inference or something. Um, but you, you have different regularizations. So there's like ridge regression and lasso regression. So Hmm. what you use for, um, different purposes, but so like, yeah. And just write a blog post about that. Right. Here's the thing about machine learning, like 80% of the time, if you're just doing machine learning, um, like just a really simple linear model will get you like 90% of the way there. Hmm. (laughs) And then, you know, it's like, (laughs) And people are like, oh, we got to use a neural network for this. I'm like, no, it's just, yeah, yeah, just yeah. a simple linear model. Like, it'll get you most of the way there. Um, and yeah. also just at any time you build a machine learning model where you're trying to make predictions, you, the first thing you should do is build a linear model as a baseline, right? Mm. This is like if you, you build a linear model um, and then if you like, okay, well, let's use like some random forest thing. Um, and if it doesn't do any better than your linear model, then you're just sort of like, there's no reason to use it, right? Um, the yeah. same thing if, you know, if you want to like, oh, we're going to try a, um, like a neural network, you know, it might not work all that much better, but have a much larger computational overhead, right. Than just a really simple linear model. So, yeah. um, yeah. So this is the thing, if you are doing, um, machine learning data, uh, analysis, data science, whatever, like you have to be, I would say build a project, just studying linear models, right. And just, yeah, yeah do that <laughs> it's the most important thing <laughs> that's amazing and also like in the same way when we try doing that uh i see most of uh most of the students or most of the learners who want to get into data science they're obsessed with kaggle scores they are obsessed with kaggle yeah. ranks and all competitions right so when they don't get that they get disappointed I, and i don't want to see them disappointed yeah. <laughs> when they when they get disappointed they won't do that for the next time right <laughs> Yeah. So what do you say about it? Like, is that good to stick with Kaggle and try and get disappointed? Or <laughs> Yeah, I think... I don't mean to get disappointed. Yeah, mm. I think Kaggle's good. So um, that makes me think of, there's this book called um, oh, The Courage to be Disliked. So it's mm. um, written by two Japanese men. I think they're men. I don't know. People. Two <laughs> Japanese people. Let's go with that. <laughs> okay, that's and, good. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so it's um it's about uh, Adlerian psychology. And so they have this like really interesting idea that that I like a lot where it's don't um don't compare yourself with other people, like just compare yourself with yourself, right? And so uh if you are doing these Kaggle competitions and you're learning and you're getting better. And like you look at your past self and you're like, I know more now than I did in the past. That's a success. And like focus on that. It's totally fine if other people are better than you. You're probably better than other people, right? But Mm -hmm. the most important thing and the thing you should really focus on is that you are becoming a better person in some way, right? Yeah. And as long as you're doing that, you're a complete success. So. I like that idea. And so, yeah, yeah. So Kaggle stuff is really good because they have all, all these data sets and they have these competitions that that are pretty um, well regulated. And so they, they give you like really nice data typically, right? So it's it's very good to, um, to use as a learning platform, just like do these projects, learn stuff. But at the same time, like do your best not to compare yourself with other people, right? And if, you're, <laughs> if you're doing these, if you're feeling like you're learning something, then mm-hmm. that is a total success. 
yeah 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 i mean i i i this just relates me in the in a you know what we, there is a saying like comparison is actually a steal of your joy right so that actually yeah. takes off your joy and they, you're no more joy like even sad you want to do you, you won't be able to do the next things further and better and better <laughs> yeah so what are what are the other things just like kagel is one of the best source that actually helps anyone uh, who has a lit- little bit of understanding of you know uh, python and mathematics a little bit and then using the specific metrics or models or making some eda and then you get into kagel and you you know you work on a play around and you learn something yeah. so what are the other things just like kagel you learn something do you have any other choices for people who want to learn Yeah, um for learning so I know um yeah so Udacity Udacity has a lot of uh free courses. There's a good mm. intro to machine learning program that is taught by um Sebastian Thrun and then one of the yeah. content developers, I think her name is Katie. Um yeah, so that's a pretty mm. good kind of general overview of machine learning. Um there's also Andrew Ng's course from mm. Coursera. It's on Cours- Coursera. Yeah. That's kind of like a, a very well known and well received um machine yeah. learning program. um yeah and then we have some um at udacity when i was there we built some free courses around deep learning so i think there's one um it's like introduction to deep learning with pytorch something like that yes yeah, so that's um if you have some if you're comfortable with python if you're comfortable you with know, programming right that's a good one to to get started with um yeah cool and and also when you when you just mentioned about you know working on building courses uh i mean you've been you've been very long doing it and you know you're being master of it <laughs> <laughs> so when we try doing it the one thing that we first thing we do is we just you know make a survey or you know we understand what people are actually expecting what people want to learn right so and we actually analyze their mindsets we analyze their thought process and then we make a content right so that is how it actually connects with both the ends and you people win and win you guys both win win situation so yeah so you've been you've been you, you all of you people are being analyzing student mindset for quite a long years so what are the things that you really found so that you know well, you you could suggest to students based on that analysis so that they could learn better grow better and apply better and become better <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so i think Yeah, so one thing like I kind of was talking about before, we always had this um issue with like students after they're done with the programs, they're just sort of like what now, right? Yeah. And we were always trying to like think of think of something to do to help our students um be like continue their their learning because at at some point you like as a student and when you're learning this stuff, you really just have to like kind of take the initiative and have the motivation and discipline to continue your learning and continue building things. Um yeah, and so as far as like yeah, student mindset, yeah, one one interesting thing I found as well is that um when you're teaching, when you're doing online education, um you don't really know anything about the students who are yeah, looking at your content, right? And yeah. so students there are students who learn from visuals and like text and you know videos and things like that um and there's some who need to see like math equations and there's some who learn um from code right and so like you see somebody actually write the code or you write it yourself and you learn that way so there's like mm. just a whole bunch of different learning styles coming in so one thing i tried to do is hit all these things um whenever i was teaching a concept it's like okay this is um visually like this is a diagram of how things look or you like have a video and you kind of go through the different parts and then also like this is how it looks in math like here's the math behind it and then here is how you would program it right um yeah yeah so that that was one of the more challenging things about yeah teaching online cool i, I mean yeah. maybe i mean such kind of a strategies what university has been built over years actually had a lot of value right they you, you can just see the testimonials how people are reacting to each and everything it's like the teachers in a way that where people easily can you know grab it and they can you know digest in their brains and they can apply right yeah. such a smooth way where you know such a complex scope with topics can be e- easily delivered direct into their brains right <laughs> so in order to do that uh, as usually like you got a huge credit for deep learning and agree and many others right so what is your thought process behind it so what is your intentions behind when you try creating a content about something so how do you think about it like do you want to you you want to explain to the millions out there who never know where who will be listening to you what sort of person will be so what would be your thought process before making any such a kind of a video or any resource for learning yeah 
So the way I normally think about it is, well, there's, yeah, I guess there's two different things. Um, so education kind of falls into two different ways. So there's, there's one where you're trying to just impart knowledge to somebody, right? And mm-hmm. then there's the other way where you're trying to help them build a skill. So yeah. on the, the build a skill part, you really need to define what you want them to be able to do at the end of your, mm-hmm. your course. Um, yeah. and so and once, once you're able to do that, once you're able to define what you want them to do, then you build a project around that, that, that mm. they, they, they build this project, um, that demonstrates they know how to do what you want them to do. Right. And then yeah. from that project, you can work backwards and you can say like, okay, well they need to know this and they need to know this and they need to know this. And then you work backwards and you help them build the skills they need to accomplish that project. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's when I, yeah. So when you're building, when you're creating content, that is trying to help people build a skill, you always start at the end, like with the skill you want them to learn and you build a project around that. Um, and then the other part where you're like just trying to impart knowledge. So what I, I always think about that is just trying to tell a story, right? So, mm. um, this is what I learned when, uh, I was in undergrad and I was working in a research lab and my, my advisor was like, yeah, if you're, if you're, um, giving a talk, if you're doing some kind of presentation, just start it like the whole thing should be a story. Right. And so you think about like, Mm -hmm. Oh, like, well, you know, Hey everybody, like we have this problem, describe the problem. Like at least people were working on it. Now, what do we like, what do we do? You know, and just kind of, you try to tell this like interesting narrative story to engage people. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's when I, when I'm doing the other kind of content where I'm just trying to, you know, but maybe you would have, you would have lied, lied a lot, maybe making some fictional stories there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just try to make it, yeah, try to like make a, a, a nice story about like, oh, you have this problem, mm. here's the solution, and let's talk about, you know, these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also I think uh, for learning purposes, not only in Udacity, uh, in, in any other places, like community is the one which actually, you know, where we could uh, learn from each other, like the other person gets you something off and you give something off. And that's where we learn more and more and people grow very quick when they are in a similar mindset, people around you. Right. So how would that thing happening uh, in pandemic, like COVID situation, like the communities, how they could actually, you know, get the communities learning coming up? Because earlier there are meetups. You go up there, you find interesting people and then you chill around and you get exchange <laughs> cards and then you learn together. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so how would now like what's your view on it? Yeah. Um, so actually, there's been a lot of online conferences this year, which mm. is cool. Um, I think NeurIPS is on uh, is doing online. And um, yeah, so I worked on an open source project called PySift, which is part of this open, open mind. That's what it's called mm. um, community. And so it's, you know, this community of, of people who are building um, software for kind of privacy related AI. Um, and PySift is like a small part of that. So they, they actually put on a uh, online conference. Right. And so I think and they also have like a really active Slack um, team hmm, for, hmm. for open mind for the community. So I think that's, um, a really good way to actually get into communities and, you know, do, because now it's, um, you know, everybody's at home. Oh, sorry. I hit that. Um, <laughs> I'm very big in my arms. Yeah. Everybody's at home and yes, yeah, so everybody's at home and we can all just like log on to zoom or, or, you know, one of the other dozen video meeting apps, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and we and you know, like somebody can just like give a talk and like stream a talk, and then you know you can answer questions. And yeah, I think it's it's really nice. And also, I think it has like some benefits as compared to in person meetings because you know if there's um, a meeting like Neurops is in the U.S., right? Hmm. It's really hard for people all over the world to get to the U.S. Right? It's very expensive to fly. Hmm. Um, and as you probably know, the, getting a visa to come to the U.S. over the last four years is ridiculous. So, mm. um, yeah, and th- there's just like a lot of people who get excluded from these conferences because they don't live in the United States or, or Canada, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so when you have these online conferences, it, it's actually much more inclusive as to who can, um, yeah, who can be in these conferences and like learn and be part of the community cool and and also like uh you know as you've been through all of this from right right from your 
teenage, I guess. So I know you're very honest. <laughs> so you. uh, what's your advice that you would give to a young person just like you? Like, okay, let's let, let me frame it in this way. So what would be the advice that you could give to a younger version of yourself? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's a tricky one as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think... <laughs> So I don't know if other people have this problem, but I, I have this problem where I, when I am like start getting bored with, with my work. So if I, if I'm in this situation where I'm not learning, if I'm just kind of doing the same thing over and over again, I, I literally get depressed. Like I, um, yeah, like you said, I'm honest. I, yeah, like I literally had clinical depression when I was in grad school because I, you know, I had, I done physics when I was an undergrad and I got to grad school and I was like planning on doing physics and then mm. there's like new stuff but I, don't, I just like sort of lost interest in it but I was in this lab and I was like doing this physics research that I just wasn't really interested in and it I just literally became clinically depressed um so and then I was like okay I can't do this anymore and that's when I switched to neuroscience right and then I just like taught myself neuroscience and I was very happy um, Ooh, but then like after a bit doing that um I was like, okay, I'm getting like bored with neuroscience. <laughs> so then I got depressed again. <laughs> um, yeah. And so at least for me, it's just like never stop learning. Like never, like don't get into this point where you're like complacent, where you're, you're just kind of going along day to day. It's like always, always be growing as a person, like always be learning, just like developing new skills. Um, yeah. So I, I think, and even like not even, if it's not even like work related, that's fine. I mean, so one thing is just becoming a, a better person, like growing, growing your empathy, like for other people. Right. So that, that is another thing. Like if you're doing that perfect, like if you're, you know, just, yeah. My advice to my younger self is like, never stop learning. Always keep growing as a person. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Way. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, just imagine like you just in, in maybe in any sort of a, you know, maybe you're feeling a little low and you never wanted to do the neuroscience again and you don't want to do the data science again. So imagine where would you be? Maybe you're in the lab working on physics and mo even more low. Right. Yeah. So that's why keeping ourselves for open for opportunities will actually let us to explore different things. Right. So, but usually when I ask people, what's the scariest and a very scariest thing that they ever done? is switching between carriers, okay? Yeah. And now I feel from you, right? So, but how <laughs> was those days when you were switching from multiple carriers? Like, I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, yeah, so when I was trying to get my current job, yeah, so I have been teaching and doing this, like, online education thing for five years or so. Um, and I really, and I, you know, I was, like, learning... AI and stuff, but I was only doing like the education part of it. Like I didn't know how it was done, like to build an actual AI product. Like I didn't have experience in that. So like, I really wanted to get um, experience doing that. Um, but yeah, it was really hard. Like I applied to a bunch of places. I, I knew people at Facebook on their AI research team. So I applied there, got rejected twice, got rejected from mm. like Airbnb and, um, <laughs> Google. I got rejected from so many places, <laughs> like mm. honestly. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was like, it's really tough because, you know, I feel, I felt like, like, oh, you know, like, I know I can do this. Like, I know if somebody just gives me a chance, I can, you know, maybe like, I don't know everything I need to know now, but I can learn it. It's, it's fine. It's really hard to get that across. Um, is that, because, you know, it's like a lot of the stuff I've done in my life. It's <clears throat> like when I switched to, to neuroscience, I didn't know any neuroscience. I didn't take in a biology yeah. course since yeah. I was in like ninth grade. Right. And I was like, I learned it, you know? So I'm just, yeah. like, um, so in, eventually like what I did is, uh, I knew some people and I started working on PISIF, which is like this open source, um, pro or like open source, um, framework, I guess. So yeah. I started working on that and I contributed some stuff and then, another person who was working on PySift had a job openings at their company. And so he got me an interview. I didn't even have to do a technical interview because like they saw my work on PySift. Um, and then yeah. I went in and they met me and they're like, cool. I was like, all right. <laughs> and they hired me. I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the power of open source, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that was after like months of applying and, and being rejected from, from a lot of different places. Yeah. And yeah, it's just like one of those things. You just kind of have to grind through it. I, I remember 
when I first started looking for data scientist jobs after grad school, you know, and there was, I, there was like this video of this guy who's, he had been a, a, you know, software developer for 10 years or something. And then he was like, yeah, I've, I've applied to like 15 different places as a, for like, as a data scientist and I've been rejected from everything. So it's just, um, yeah, it's actually like really difficult to change careers because you don't have like the experience you, you I'm, I'm doing air quotes which people can't see on yeah. the podcast <laughs> yeah it's like you you know people see your resume they're like oh he doesn't have the experience or she doesn't have the experience yeah. and um yeah but you just kind of have to grind through it and eventually um you'll find something yeah i think but when someone i mean i think you're, you're actually very kind and actually looking at the things i think maybe if someone comes to you for a job and then looking forward and sending up their resumes, I think you may be a little kind. Maybe I don't know what 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 was going internally to him. Maybe how many careers he has been yeah. switching around. So, <laughs> so that's with the kindest part of you. And you know, when you switched, uh, maybe from different roles, from physics to a neuroscience, right? So maybe there there might be a few things that literally help you to become a better version of yourself from neuroscience, yeah. right? That will be definitely helping to a lot of others as well. Like what are those common things that would definitely help a lot of people out there who are actually learning or working for jobs or working for things that they really don't like or uh, what are those things? Like would you want to share nice. something to others? Yeah, so here's an interesting neuroscience thing that I learned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't include data science again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a, a part of the brain called a striatum so it's um, part of a larger, larger structure called the basal ganglia. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the scientist Anne Grabiel, and she's like spent, I would say, most of her career just studying the striatum. And I, I loved her work. And I, I met her once, and she was wonderful. Very excited. So anyway, so the striatum is involved in mm -hmm. habit forming. So you know it's like you, you um, every time you mm -hmm. leave your, your room, you turn the light off and you don't think about that. Well, it's because there's like these connections with the striatum yeah. that yeah. there's like something in your brain that triggers it and it goes through your striatum and makes the motor movement. Right. So, but the deal is, is that, um, in her research, she argues that the striatum is also involved in emotional habits. So what this means is when something happens in your life, um, and you have this habit of feeling a certain way about it. Um, and the thing is like, you can't really, so the thing about emotions is you don't control your emotions, right? And you just, you just feel what you feel. There's nothing you can really do about it. Um, mm. and but the thing is with emotional habits, just like physical habits, you can unlearn them. So if you, um, yeah. So if you experience like this, this negative emotion every time something happens or like the way I think about it is, um, something I've been trying to do is teach myself not to judge people. Right. And so you're like walking down on the street, you see somebody and then like this judgment, this negative thought about them pops up in your head. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, if you, if you are aware of that and you're able to be like, no, that's not okay. Right. If you're able to, to like understand what's happening and like kind of control your thoughts, then over time you can kind of unlearn this, this emotional habit of like seeing, seeing somebody and making this immediate judgment about them or like any, anything like this. And so that's like one, um, one thing I think about a lot as far as like trying to become a better person is realizing when things produce negative emotions in yourself and trying to unlearn that, that habit. Definitely. I mean, I think, I mean, not only in technology, but also in life, like the, one of the most powerful things that a human could actually make the best use of is actually unlearning and relearning and then making yourself moving forward, right? Yeah. So that is like a crucial part. Like people would even, but but here's a tricky part, right? It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, <laughs> and people does the kind of a, like hundred yeah. days of code, and they say like you know something like hundred days of change, hundred days of X, and then they do it, keep doing it, and they get better, right? So, but in another way. If you if you study about uh, James Clear, who is the author of uh, Atomic Habits, uh, he just mentioned like I know uh, habits are not deadlines to be crossed, but a lifestyle to be lived. Yeah. So um, the most important thing when when learning anything new uh, is to be consistent, right? So um, yeah. So I I played um, music when I was in high school, and then I it was like I played saxophone and bass guitar. But then when I was um, in grad school. I started like really learning how to play um, acoustic guitar. And so 
basically what I would do is like I had my guitar next to my desk. So like anytime I was sitting at my desk, I was like, okay. And I would just grab my guitar and I would start like learning things, but at least an hour every day. Right. So, so this is the thing you got to do. If you're trying to learn something, you got to do it every day for, um, probably at least an hour, right? If you're learning how to code, you just really have to do it every day. Um, and this is, um, I think uh, there's a term for it, like determined practice or disciplined practice, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it's just like you just, you really have to like grind it out to build skills. And so you just yeah. every day for at least like an hour, two hours. And then when you're doing it, make sure you're doing it right. So here's, um, yeah, another thing I had a, um, a music teacher in high school who's like, if you practice it wrong, you're going to play it wrong. Right. Hmm. And so when you're, when you're practicing things, when you're learning things, you really want to take it slow um, at first. So you get it right. Because if you learn it the wrong way, then you're going to be doing it the wrong way um, going forward hmm. in the future. So yeah. yeah. So hundred days of code like makes a lot of sense. Cause it's, you know, you make this commitment to just actually sit down, write code for a hundred days in a row. Right. Um, doing anything a hundred days, hundred days in a row will be, probably teach you that thing right if you want to learn to yeah. juggle if you try to juggle 100 days in a row you'll be a very good juggler at the end of those 100 days absolutely yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah definitely i mean um uh, you know as you mentioned earlier like if you learn d in a wrong way then we definitely do in a wrong way right <laughs> that's the thing yeah. that literally blew my mind because that's usually often we, we we commonly see other in others and even within ourselves right we try doing something and we can't do it well and sometimes we feel maybe i learned it in a different way that is not the right way right but fixing up yeah. And moving forward is the way that we actually can make it, you know, pretty better and better, right? So, and this is the question that I actually got from my seniors, uh, where, we, I mean, you got a pretty huge answer for this, I guess. So, <laughs> so I wanted to hear it from you. Like, um, what's the best part of contributing open source? What, what is the best part? Why, why do we need to do that? Other than, you know, hel uh, helping the project. So what's the best part? Like, give the answer to my friend. Yeah. <laughs> So the best part is, uh, yeah, you can get jobs out of it. So, mm, yeah, uh, like, honestly, absolutely. yeah, because it's because um, the thing is to get jobs in industry, if you don't have experience mm. in like working as a professional developer, professional whatever, um, it's really hard to get a job as a professional developer. Um, yeah, it's, it's this interesting thing um, where it's like, you know, like, all these people, all these companies are hiring for entry level positions. They're like, must have three years of experience. How does an entry level <laughs> person get three years of experience? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah. And so doing open source, like working on open source projects gets you the experience you need to get jobs. Right. Um, so that's, that's the big one. Secondly, mm -hmm. um, you're going to meet some really great people. Uh, yeah. yeah, be part of a community. This is like some really great people you can meet. You make new friends. That's good. Um, yeah, and then also you're just learning new things, right? And you're um, learning how to work on a team with other people. You're learning like new new technologies. Um, you know, there's probably like some new part of this project that you take on, and you learn how to do that, and you become a more knowledgeable and skilled person. So I'm a big fan of open source. I I also like build a lot of just kind of personal projects that I'm just like, eh, this will be fun. And then I just put it on GitHub. So technically yeah. it's open source. Nobody's worked on it, but me, but at the same time it was really fun. <laughs> it's on GitHub. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I just mentioned it earlier, right? You've worked on a few Zappy and all of that. So mm -hmm. how about like you've been into this uh, AI in production, right? So how was your experience in working with AI in production? Not most of the people will get a chance to work with production, right? Yeah. So it is hard. So <laughs> let me tell you. Um, yeah. So firstly, like all the education online is basically only focused on the model part of, of deep learning and AI. So mm -hmm. what are the different types of models, how to train models? Um, and that's about it. So there's very little content out there about how to actually take this model that you trained and build an application with it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is... Um, Actually, one thing, yeah, when I was at Udacity in the deep learning program, we added uh, a new part at the end that uses Amazon SageMaker to actually use a trained model to deploy, do some yeah. task. Yeah, mm -hmm. to deploy it. So super cool. Um, yeah, so so that's one thing. And 
Um, yeah. One of the hardest parts is, as, as you probably know, um, deep learning networks tend to be computationally inefficient, right? So that is, it takes a, a lot of, of work to just like get an image, pass it through a convolutional network, get it out, um, and then do other stuff with it. So like one of the, the biggest challenges is, you know, if you're building a computer vision program or even like natural language, right? Um, if you need in general, the, the response from the model and as close to real time as you can get. Right. Um, so just trying to work with the hardware, like maybe, maybe the hardware you have, like, doesn't have a GPU. Like, how do you, how do you like handle this? Right. And so, yeah, and it's been very difficult trying to get these models that we train, put it on some hardware, get it to run fast enough. Um, and at some accuracy that you're okay with. So, and, and there's just not very much, um, good options out there right now. And it's also doubly difficult because every single different hardware has a different kind of native framework for, for running neural network models. Um, and so like, uh, NVIDIA, NVIDIA machines, you know, like they have their Jetsons that all requires tensor RT. So you have to convert your models into tensor RT. Um, Intel hardware uses open Vino. Um, ARM hardware has its like own compute library. So yes, like everything you do, um, you know, you train it in PyTorch, but then you have to convert it to this other thing. And then it only works on this one hardware. There's just so many, so many things. And then another <laughs> thing is that a lot of, a lot of research and deep learning is like chasing state of the art performance. And they do that by making bigger models. Right. And so a lot of the push and research is bigger models that are slower that you can't use in production. So um, I think that's like one area of, of research that I'd be really interested in is like, how do you make the most efficient models possible? A beautiful answer in a long run. Like it's it yeah. literally. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot. That's awesome. It. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we couldn't actually explain in a single phrase like the AI in production is one of the, you know. <laughs> it's very hard, yeah. <laughs> yeah, where we actually have a lot of uh, you know, anxiousness in our brain when we try doing something in the production, right? That's yeah. that's always the fun. And how about like, when, uh, what's the actual, you know, we call like applied machine learning and a machine learning, right? So could you, could you, could you explain what's actual most differences or any similarities between applied and not applied machine learning? <laughs> Yeah, so I would say yeah, applied machine learning is is trying to make actual like applications out of your your machine learning models. So um, yeah, I would say like and then like other machine learning. So there's kind of two different things where you're, you're a data scientist and you're building your machine learning models to gain insights about um, some data. You know, so like we have students at, at an online education company and you have um, data about that, and then maybe you can infer some like behaviors from, from that, you know, maybe like, oh, well, like this content actually helps them learn more as compared to this content or like maybe this, um, interaction actually helps them or, or it makes them, um, you know, less able to learn. So that's sort of like machine learning, but not really, I would say that's not really applied machine learning, but if you're trying to make an application, um, an actual program, a product where you're using machine learning, as, as part of that product, then I see that as applied machine learning. And so, um, hmm. and that falls into you, you have like engineering constraints, like how, how fast can, um, do yeah. you need this thing to actually run? Right. Um, whereas if you're just trying to, as a data scientist, to like build a Jupyter notebook to like consume some data and produce some graphs, right. You don't really care yeah. all that much about how fast it runs. Hmm. Definitely. I mean, and also like initially, I think we spoke about, Cafe, <laughs> and again, all about PyTorch and TensorFlow. So uh, why specifically PyTorch is kind of precious for you and, uh, you know, what makes it a bit different? You know, it needs not to be biased, but that's all fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I really uh, enjoyed PyTorch. So like I said, I said before, like for, I first started learning with TensorFlow um, and we built the, the deep learning program using TensorFlow. And... It's fine. So the thing with TensorFlow is the way the way it works is you define a static graph and then you run your data through that graph. Um, but it's a very I would say non Pythonic way to actually write code. It just it doesn't really work with the the rest of Python very well. And you have to think in a mm. in a different 
manner, like the concepts that you're using are different than you normally would with Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, genuine. Yeah, um, and then Py yeah PyTorch was released, and it's very similar to NumPy. So NumPy is just one of the most beautiful libraries of any you know program language I've ever worked with. Like <laughs> NumPy is just wonderful. Yeah, um, yeah, and then PyTorch very much took off from that and they, they tried to make the, the way you use it, the way you write your code, very similar to NumPy. And so a lot of times I think of PyTorch as NumPy that has a nice module for building neural networks and also automated, like automatic gradients, right? But otherwise it's like really similar to NumPy. You can, you can use PyTorch to do anything, or like not anything, but you know, most things you, you want to do in um, NumPy, you can use PyTorch for it. It's just, you also have like, gradient descent and you have neural network stuff and you have, you know, gradients, you know, um, and you have optimizers, you know, so this is like all these like extra things that you get. Um, yeah. And it was actually, uh, kind of interesting at Udacity is we, um, switched the deep learning program from TensorFlow to PyTorch. Um, hmm. but like, as I said before, we had pretty close ties with Google because Sebastian Thrun worked at Google and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. we had worked with Google, um, previously and yeah, a lot of people got upset because <laughs> I was like, we're going to PyTorch. <laughs> and yeah, and then people at Google were like yelling at me. and Well, they weren't yelling at me, but yeah. I, and I, I got and into I, some I, hot water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, I, and I know the interview with uh, Samit Chintali, like he's the founder, I mean, who invented PyTorch there. I've seen that like in Veracity maybe that time. And I can see your excitement when asking questions to him. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All about that. Cool. And uh, that's all about it from my end. I've been asking you a lot of questions which are so introspective for me. And your answer is so much insightful. But you, I guess you remember we released an AMA banner. Yeah. So just saying, asking for questions. So you got a few questions that I took down. There are like a lot of questions, but I picked only a few specifically here. Cool. <laughs> so which Perfect. are fun and also which are really good. Okay. So let me go with the first one. Uh, what was retrospective the best thing about grad school and the worst thing about grad school? You were Ooh. transported back in time. Would you do it again? <laughs> yeah, I had a really interesting experience in grad school. I, I don't know if other people mm. like, I don't know. So the deal is, um, grad school is great. Like if I, honestly, if I was independently wealthy, like if I didn't have to work, mm. I would probably just like do PhDs for the rest of my life. Cause I, I love learning. I love having the freedom to just do whatever my mind wants to do. Um, yeah. And so for example, so yeah, I wrote this, um, yeah, I wrote this Python library called sample for it's, it's, for sampling from posterior distributions of, of Bayesian models. So I got like really into Bayesian statistics when I was um, in grad school. And I kind of just like took three months off of my, my normal grad school work and just learned everything <laughs> I could about Bayesian statistics. And I, and I built this library because, you know, I was like using it in my research, but at the same time, mm. I'm like, yeah. And like um, IPython, so IPython is wonderful. Fernando Perez, who uh, worked above me at Berkeley, actually, he was like literally mm -hmm. the floor above me. Um, so he built IPython when he was, uh, in grad school, he's either, he's either in grad school or a postdoc and he basically stopped his work and built IPython. So <laughs> this is like a really common thing where uh, grad school is, yeah. is wonderful. And like academia is wonderful in that you, um, can kind of just go wherever your mind wants to go. And it's very fulfilling and, and a lot of fun in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The other side of it is that the, you're, you're basically going to get, going to get depressed. Like almost everybody gets depressed in grad school. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, you're working <laughs> like I, when I was in grad school, I would like leave my apartment at like 10 or 11 AM. Um, and then I would get back to my apartment at like 11 PM, like every day, including weekends. Mm. Like I, I worked a lot of weekends. Um, you just, you work a lot. And a lot of times, you know, I, I, I worked with people who, they worked on their experiment for a year, two years, and then no results. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's just like so demoralizing and it can be like really difficult. Um, and yeah, so that's like, it's just very emotionally taxing to, mm -hmm. to be in grad school, uh, at least like in a PhD program. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even though like master's programs are like really hard too, cause they cram so much into like two years of work. 
Um, so I don't, I don't envy master's students either. <laughs> <laughs> so on top of actual existing uh, depressions that you already have, sort of we feel low when the things won't work, we think. And I think you might be also having some other depressions <laughs> in the grad school. So definitely that should also be hanging on. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's how it goes. So yeah. here, here's the next one for you. So uh, how are you s- staying sane during this year 2020? <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. That's a big question. It's been a crazy year, hasn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> Interesting facts. So, uh, <laughs> so the apartment below our apartment, um, the pe- mm. people moved out of it. And then the day when San Francisco did their lockdown, you know, they're like, okay, everybody stay home. Everywhere is closed. They started construction on the apartment below ours, like, like demolition. Mm. They were like broke everything like mm. tore down walls in the apartment below ours and they were doing construction down there for like three months. So mm. we were, we we're like stuck in our apartment, everything's closed and they're just like mm. grinding away and sawing and hammering just like three <laughs> months. It was crazy. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a, yeah, a rough year. Um, mm. yeah. How do I stay sane? Yeah. So one thing I've been doing, um, you drink a lot of tea. Yeah. <laughs> I drink a lot of tea. Yeah. And just try to like, Oh man. Yeah. That's a tough question. <laughs> so I try to, you do take bath I, regularly. <laughs> yeah. I try to, yeah, work, work on projects. I think one thing that's mm-hmm. helped a lot is I've been talking to my friend groups more. And so, you know, I set up, um, just like virtual hangouts on, there's like tons of different yeah. apps now. Right. And so yeah. Yeah. just trying to be more connected with my friends and my family that, that helps a lot. Um, yeah. And like working on projects. And the thing is, I think a lot of people are having problems being productive and like focusing on things, which is totally reasonable, totally fine. But then people like feel bad because they're not being productive and it's like, it's okay. These are crazy times. You don't like, (laughs) as long as you're surviving, that's great. Um, yeah, this has been a crazy year. I just, yeah, I just try to be, be positive about things. And, you know, like I live in California and we've had all these, these wildfires, right. And the sky was orange. It was Hmm. the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, (laughs) yeah. But the thing is like every, everything ends, right. There, you know, there was a flu pandemic in 1918 that ended world war one, world war two, those things ended like bad things happen. They end. You just kind of have to remember that it's not going to be like this forever. Right. And so, at some point it will end and things will be better. Yeah. Yeah. So when you speak about the productivity, so I got this question, like, how do you, how do you manage your every single day? Like how do you keep yourself away from burning out and then, you know, being productive, doing the work that you wanted to and not to get, not getting burned. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So for that, yes, it's hard because yeah, since I work from home, um, I've been working from home for a while, but so, I set very kind of strict time limits for myself. So I start working at 8 a.m. And then when it's 5 p.m., I stop, right? And so, um, and then I try to work on um, other projects. It's been it's been hard because I spend a lot of my day like writing code. And then a lot of the kind of personal projects I want to work on are also writing code. And so, you know, I kind of get a little burnt out writing code all the time. Um yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, and so I just um try to stay focused. Uh what works pretty well for me is um if I like put my headphones on, I start playing some music and I kind of get lost in the music and in my thoughts and like my screen and then I can cool. really focus um that way. That's how I focus on things. Yeah. Great. I mean, that should help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, here's the last question for you and uh, that is there a work hard, work hard machine learning model that you use to solve many problems in your work? Or is every problem idiosyncratic and deserving their own model? Interesting. Yeah. So when you, um, for every problem, so it's kind of interesting when you're building new products. So the thing about machine learning, if you're building a machine learning product, the data that you put in it is going to determine what that product actually is. So for every single product, every single problem, you really need to have a very specific data set for that, right? So, mm. um, you know, 
the thing is you, people talk about these like cat and dog classifiers, right? You showed a picture, yeah. you know, it says it's a cat. You showed a picture, it says it's a dog. The only reason that it's a cat and dog classifier is because your data set has cats and dogs, right? Yeah. So like the model itself doesn't really matter all that much. And you can use that same model with different data sets and get different models and different products out. So yeah. Um, yeah. So every problem that you're working on, it's really specific to the data that you're using. Um, and like the actual model architecture doesn't really matter all that much. You just get different um, like performance as far as computation and accuracy. Superb. Yeah. So that's how we end about talking about the models, which is <laughs> definitely requires their own based on the intuition. I mean, based on the instance that we have the data and all. Yeah. So that's a great answer. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. And it's been an immense pleasure for me to have you and having an insightful conversation that all the undergraduates or all the students or all the people who are to shift their careers into data science and work on machine learning and wanted to get their jobs and get their careers into my data and data mystic and all about that. So I think... And I hope everything that we spoke will be definitely having a little bit of impact at least. That's enough, right? That's so huge thing for others. So I think it will be having a huge thing. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Definitely. I really enjoyed it. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. it's great. If you are the one looking forward to adapting machine learning into your career, take a look at our sponsors, Sundog Education, and start free trial with a lot of hands-on activities and exercises. You can practice whatever you have learned. Visit sundog-education.com and you can find all the direct links in the episode notes below. Thank you.